Welcome to um, Planning for Atomic Gold at this uh, rather lovely venue, the University of Notre Dame, which I discovered uh, a few months ago when I was invited to come and give a talk here. And I thought it was such a beautiful venue and so central that we'd like to um, hijack it for one of our events. So very kindly they, uh, they've allowed us to uh, hire the space. So I'm, um, I'm Nicola Triscott, I'm the director of the Arts Catalyst, uh, and this is the Arts Catalyst's 20 year anniversary. And uh, so we've got quite a busy year of exhibitions and events uh, and commissions. And one of the things we're doing is looking back at our 20 years of practice and having an occasional event that looks back at commissions and exhibitions that we've done in the past and how they've impacted on uh, artist practice today, both the artists who took part in those uh, commissions and events um, and how that spread to other artists and the impact on curatorial practice. So we invited uh, Eddie Carpenter to come and program the first of these events uh, around our atomic nuclear theme which has been an investigatory strand that's run through the Arts Catalyst from the very early days. So just uh, a little background to the Arts Catalyst. Uh, we're saying this is our 20th anniversary because really um, our events started going in 94 and we became constituted as an organisation in 94. Um, but obviously the, the gleam in the eye often starts a bit earlier than that. So it was probably around 93 that I looked around and thought uh, I'd like to I'd like to commission artists who I'm really interested in, and I think there's a lot of interesting things happening in science and technology uh, at the moment. And then at that point, there didn't seem to be much connection or crossover or intersection between the two worlds. And because my background, well, I, I studied um, physics initially at university uh, before doing a degree in cultural and political geography and then going into the arts, um, it seemed quite a natural thing to try and bring people together from both disciplines and see if we could start up a conversation. And artists being artists, uh, these things started to catalyze very quickly and immediately uh, the artists that I was putting into these conversations wanted to make work, started to make work. And so what had initially started as a nice idea for a project uh, turned into, yes, what has probably become um, a major part of my life's work and has kept me gainfully occupied uh, for the last 20 years and has kept a number of other people gainfully occupied because the team has, has grown and developed over the years. And lots of other ideas and inputs have come into the organisation which has made it a very exciting exciting place to, to work. Uh, one of the things that runs through our program are these investigational strands, and I think that maybe sets us apart a little bit from other arts commissioning organisations. So we've had a big interest in biotechnology and where the new biosciences are going. We have another interest in what's happening in the, in the polar regions. Uh, we're interested in uh, ecology and environment and the impact on other species of changes in the environment and energy and what our energy futures are and within that the atomic and nuclear theme has just continued to pop up and of course another area that we're very known for is our, our uh, investigation of space exploration and what that means culturally for us. So a little bit about how the atomic, uh, how the atomic strand came into our programme I've been running the Arts Catalyst for three or four years, uh, pretty much on my, on my own, uh, with the artists that I was working with. And in 97, I met up with Rob Lafrenet, who uh, became the Arts Catalyst curator and is still working with us. And um, Rob and I had some really exciting conversations at the beginning of our working relationship. And really, in the very first conversation, I'd found uh, an article in New Scientist, just a small article about an artist, uh, a sculptor, who lived on the Hanford Nuclear Reservation in the United States called James Acord. Uh, and I said to Rob that this guy looks like the real deal. 
He'd been living on the Hanford Nuclear Reservation for 15 years, and he'd moved there specifically to engage with the science in quite a kind of naive way, I think, that he was excited by, uh, you know, stories that had come out of uh, the origins of the atomic bomb and, um, you know, the excitement around the science, particularly at that time. And I don't know if anyone saw the Oppenheimer series that the BBC did, uh, which I watched in my teens. It, it was very exciting, it was a very, you know, it's a very frightening series about when it ended up, but actually the, the stuff about the science is, is very exciting, and Jim had picked up on that. And he'd gone to the Hanford Nuclear Reservation thinking that he was going to have these extraordinary enlightening conversations about science and Eastern um, religion with the scientists, and of course found a very different culture there, because the Hanford is, is really the heart of America's nuclear program, there are about 12 nuclear reactors in various stages of commission or decommission. Uh, it's, where they, it's where they bring the, the, nuclear, the heart of the cores of the nuclear submarines and bury them. They have nuclear hospitals. It's, um, it's really an incredible place. So I don't think Jim had really left the Hanford Reservation for about 15 years. So Rob and I flew out to Seattle and then drove out to the desert where the Hanford Nuclear Reservation is and spent a week with James Acor in his studio and got to know him and he is, was a really remarkable individual. He was trying to, you know, being there for 15 years, he'd really started to embed himself within the community but he was also very much an outsider. And it became very obvious that his life there was, a, was an artwork in itself. Uh, because of the way that he was trying to engage with the community and he was trying to shift their ideas and he was trying to set up conversations between the scientists at Hanford and uh, the artistic and environmental community in Seattle. He'd also got, um, he wanted to build a sculpture to the nuclear age. And like many things in Jim's life, this had, this had a paradox within it because at the one on the one hand, it was marking uh, the nuclear age, and on the other, it was supposed to be serving as a, a warning marker to generations in the future. Do not come to this poison, polluted area. Now, I could bang on about Hanford for a very long time, um, so I'm going to stop myself now. But just to say that the week we spent with Jim Acord, uh, we then persuaded him to come to the UK and give a talk at the Royal Institution as part of our Eye of the Storm conference. And uh, Rob and I then decided that we wanted to um, commission an exhibition uh, inspired by Jim's work. And we commissioned two other artists uh, alongside that. One was Kerry Young, who will be joining us later, and the other was Mark Ariel Waller. Uh, and the Atomic Exhibition went on at Imperial in 1998, uh, and then went to Nottingham Now Festival in 99, and it went to Slovenia. And I remember one of the scientists who came along to talk with Jim A. Cord at the Royal Institution, um, John Hassar from Imperial, who's an anti-nuclear activist, said to me, why are you raising this issue? Nuclear, <laughs> nuclear is dead. Uh, there will be no more nuclear stations built anywhere in the world. Um, I think the last 15 years have shown that that was a little premature. So since then, largely because of artists and curators, the nuclear theme has popped up again and again. First there was our nuclear uh, exhibition, which was Chris Oakley, Kip Kipriano, and Simon Hollington in 2008. And then uh, Ellie Carpenter, who's a curator and a lecturer at Goldsmiths College, came to us with um, a, her proposal for her research project to look at the interplay between culture and nuclear issues, nuclear science, and the nuclear industry. Um, I'm not going to talk about that much because I'm sure Ellie will go into that. So this event, the other aspect of this event is, is the archive that we're developing because as well as doing a, a few events that reflect back on our program, what we also realized is we had, I'm going to call this section, sorry, I'm going to go over, the, the cupboard to the archive to the resource. We have 20 years worth of documents, images, piles of videos in kind of decaying beta umatic VHS formats in the cupboard. And we need to get them sorted out. 
we needed to get them digitised, we needed to get them online, we needed to sort ourselves out and get a decent archive. And while we started to do that with uh, uh, our archivist, Z, who joined us a couple of years ago, uh, we felt that this could become an extraordinary online resource. So what we're doing at the moment is, is we have a bit of a pilot prototype um, platform which uh, has been designed by Lisa Haskell. And um, we would invite you to come have a look at it, have a poke around, and let us know how you use archives, whether this is at all interesting to you, what you would like to see on it, how you might find it useful to be structured. So there'll be time during the lunch break at the end uh, and in the tea break to have a, have a bit of a look. So we'd really welcome people's feedback on that. Is this a useful thing for us to be doing? So uh, this event, I just want to thank um, Ellie for programming it, and to thank Claudia, and Z, and Lisa and Joe in particular for uh, organising things. A little bit of housekeeping, uh, just to tell you about the day. There will be the first break will be at twelve thirty for lunch. Um, you have to go out and find your own lunches. I think there are quite a few kind of uh, sandwich shops and places um, up the Haymarket. It's probably the easiest place to look. We will be providing coffee and tea and stuff towards the end of that. Uh, we'll have another break at 3.30 in which we'll provide coffee and tea um, and then we'll be finishing at 5.30 I think. So um, enjoy the day and I'm going to hand over to Ellie Carpenter. Thank you very much. So thank you very much, Nicola, and thank you everyone for coming. Uh, we seem to have a full house, which is very exciting. And um, today is going to be a really interesting day, I think, bringing together knowledge from science, the visual arts and literature to rethink the cultural frameworks of nuclear materials and nuclear archives. And all of our work touches on how the nuclear changes our sense of time and temporality in different ways, how nuclear events drive forward the history of progress or a belief in nuclear modernity, positioning the nuclear age within the human time of the Anthropocene. So we're starting to look not just at the nuclear age as a 20th century phenomenon, but as a kind of geological process. So before we begin the day, I'd like to say a few words about the ideas behind planning for atomic gold um, and also some various plans for nuclear archives that are planned in the future and maybe to make uh, some distinction or think about the relationship between markers and archives. <laughs> I just have to nod to Claudia to uh, change the slides. So you'll recognise this painting from the publicity material. This is um, an amazing painting uh, by John Garth that's called American Progress. And the painting captures the idea of manifest destiny, the natural, almost religious belief in territorial expansion and the destiny of progress. In the 19th century, mining gold, like generating electricity, held the exploitation of resources to power the new world. And here, this is, this is progress, she is American progress. You can see she's dragging electricity, these electric cables, to the Wild West. We can almost imagine gold panners, you know, gold prospectors, panning for gold, whilst the electricity pylons are being put up along the riverbank. But in the 20th century, this kind of utopian territorial expansion focused on the nuclear project, but also new territories in space. And today we speculate on the future somewhat differently. Like James Accord, the artist that uh, Nicola was telling us about, we still hope that alchemical discovery could enable the reduction of radiation levels of existing waste. There's all sorts of research into different kinds of lower uh, level radioactive uh, fission, like thorium fission. But for now, the industry's solution is to attempt to reverse mine radioactive exploits back into the ground and build nuclear archives for the future. <laughs> so imagine in a hundred years time what the world might be like in 2114 
Imagine that this low-level waste site at Drigg has closed. We already have antique radioactive waste. Imagine this is closed and it's now responsibility of the general public. Nuclear archives will have been built. Weapons and power stations will still be being commissioned, decommissioned, sorry, decommissioned. Geological waste repositories will be very slowly filling up. The belief in nuclear weapons and nuclear energy may be seen, we hope it will be seen, as an archaic cult, as a historical phenomenon. And the arts catalyst, of course, will still be going and inviting artists and historians to revisit their archive of nuclear artists. <coughs> So there are a number of plans for nuclear archives, and I thought I'd just talk about this as it brings together many of the different discussions and areas, areas of research in the room. So we might think of uh, archives in three, nuclear archives in three distinct ways. One is the industry archive of itself and its community, the archive of waste storage sites, where geological storage sites, and also the cultural archive of artworks um, and music, let's think about art more, more broadly here. But this slide is of the first kind of nuclear archive, of and for the industry itself. We can speculate about the kind of documents that will be in it, its plans, itineraries, transport schedules, decommissioning schedules, environmental monitoring, decommissioning, etc. And in the UK, these documents already exist with every nuclear power station in the country and every research um, a nuclear research facility in the country, but they're all going to be brought together in Scotland. And this is right up the north northeast tip of Scotland um, at Wick. And this is the town of Wick, and this is the Wick Airport. And I'm not sure exactly where, but somewhere around this airport, they will be building um, a nuclear archive for 26 kilometres of records. And the first records that are planned to be moved to this archive are for Doom Ray which alone weigh 250 tonnes. So if anyone's feeling a bit overwhelmed with archives and, and wants, to, or wants to work with archives for the next few hundred years, this would be the place to get in trouble. Um, they employed several thousand people on the decommissioning of Doom Ray, but um, I, I read in the NDA reports that there will be 20 full-time staff working on this 26 kilometres of archive, so I guess you get just over a kilometre each. <laughs> so, one of the uh, nuclear things that needs to be archived and marked are, is, is the geological storage of radioactive waste. And here are some different waste types and um, a diagram of, of roughly how, what the plans are. So the nuclear waste repository, geological repository, in Britain was planned for Cumbria, but it's been rejected so far. So we don't have anything like this built in Britain, but there are a couple being built around the world, and pretty much every country has planning applications in to build these repositories. I'm not going to talk too much about this, because Shelley Mobbs is going to tell us a bit more about um, geological waste and marking, and also about the RKNM Recording Knowledge and Memory Research Project. Um, which has identified the need for the knowledge of geological repositories to be embedded within many forms of culture, including site markers, which are the, you know, the kind of sticking around or sign where waste is, but also to embed knowledge in culture much more broadly, to embed knowledge of the nuclear within our cultural archives. Now these archives, whoever they're run by, have the potential to function differently, not just as an industry project, but a cultural project, one that can tell different kinds of stories in multiple forms and registers. I think what's happening today is that the um, radioactive materials are entering the public realm in new ways. They're entering uh, a kind of public discussion through public consultation processes. And this marks the shift from the state ownership of weapons production, to the private uh, ownership of energy production, to the public responsibility, whatever that means, for waste storage. And once in the public realm, democratic and accessible archives must be created. Derrida footnotes in his lecture on archive fever, there is no political power without control of the archive, if not of memory. Effective democratization 
will always be measured by this essential criteria. The participation in and the access to the archive, its constitution and its interpretation. So how nuclear archives enable participation and uphold this principle of access remains to be seen. I don't really know how, how this is um, being speculated upon. But how, so we, we might ask questions of these archives, what's missing and how can new items be added? And of course, uh, visual artworks are already archived, they're already collected by museums. And international museums are already collecting artwork generally, but they're also collecting nuclear artwork. And this is um, a slide, which is a screen grab from a work by Kota Takuchi in Japan. And Kota Takuchi's work has been brought, or some of his work around uh, Fukushima has been brought by the Tokyo Contemporary Art Museum. He's very famous for the finger pointing artwork, the, the Fukushima worker pointing at the camera which is, is quite well known, but I thought I'd just tell you about this work which is a bit less well known. On the second day after the tsunami, he recorded his desktop for the whole day, and the artwork is, is um, a snapshot of that day. But the different windows on his laptop stream um, national television media, social networks, and international media. And there are moments where the TV presenters are speechless, watching events unfold, waiting for information. And Derrida again reminds us that the process of archiving produces as much as records the event. So in Takuchi's work, the voyeuristic experience of remotely viewing the disaster is reminiscent of Hayes' account of the atomic sublime, where the explosion is an unmeasurable event of fascinatingly hor horrific proportions. So there's a kind of addictive Kind of viewing of what's happening through this kind of remote lens. And the other point that Derrida makes that I want to end on is, um, is about the kind of institutionalizing of archives and how materials become institutionalized. So he describes how archives shelter, house, and institutionalize documents, marking the passage from private to public. He says very poignantly, this does not mean always mean from the secret to the non-secret. So there's still not only things being lost in the archive, but a kind of restriction or embeddedness of data or information. So I've just got a few kind of questions <laughs> concluding from uh, my thoughts on, the, on nuclear archives, which um, maybe we'll come back to a bit at the end of the day. So if building an archive institutionalizes knowledge and experience, formalizing it, perhaps, perhaps attempting closure on a particular moment in time or a particular period in time, what happens next? What happens when the nuclear is archived? Does that enable kind of closure and a non-nuclear world to emerge? What happens when artist practices are archived? And also what happens when uh, nuclear artworks are archived and where and will they be archived in the future? So I'm not going to say more about Derrida and archives. <laughs> That's um, I think that we've got some really interesting works today, and not everybody's practice focuses specifically on the nuclear, but opens up different um, ways of thinking about time and materials, and um, the way in which we kind of perceive ourselves in relation to the world and in relation to time and temporality. Many people, in fact everyone in the audience here, has a huge amount of knowledge, experience, research, interests, practices. And we will have sets of three presentations with time for a discussion afterwards. We'll also have a kind of plenary session at the end. So I really hope that you are able to stay for that and people can talk a bit more about their own practices. At the end of the day, we'll invite all of the speakers up to the podium here, or maybe we'll sit around here and we'll see how, how many there are, how many we are. Um, so, yeah, I hope that during the day you can spend time with the Arts Catalyst archive, um, some of the nuclear culture objects as well, and uh, we can have a very interesting place. So thank you.